Good day, everyone. We're going to get started. I know everyone's still uh, lining up, but we have a lot to cover here. Um, welcome to the Re Citrus C uh, Research Exchange. My name is Anthony St. George. I'm the Director of Development for Citrus. Um, we'd like to welcome our web viewers today. And we want to dive right in um, with Dr. Jean-Paul Jacob. We're delighted to have him today to speak. Jean-Paul is a special advisor to Citrus, has been at Berkeley for many years, um, since 67, uh, I believe you said? Uh, uh, yeah, no, six, 60, six, 67. 67. Sorry, so he knows Berkeley well, he knows IBM well, and is our liaison to IBM. Um, he has a lot he's going to cover today, so I'm going to just let him introduce himself and his uh, many accomplishments, and uh, please uh, come to your seats as quickly and quietly as possible. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming, and I'm going to be a dessert for your lunch. Those of you who only came for the food, please step to the back of the line and... Some of you may be interested in the next three hours for this presentation. <laughs> My name is Jean-Paul Jacob, as advertised, and I'm a research emeritus at IBM. For those of you who did not keep up with your contemporary Latin, emeritus means retired and old, <laughs> but not dead yet. I worked for IBM until 1962 when I retired, and now I'm also a visiting scholar or a scholar in residence at UC Berkeley where I'm a special advisor to Citrus, so my office is in this building at Citrus. Those of you who would like to know a little more about me can do what I did, take the collection of all my biographies and make one image that represents them all. There is a technique, it's a site available on the web called, uh, called a Wordle. Wordle is a technique that takes a text as long as you want and represents it graphically in one image in which the words that appear more frequently in the, te in the text are in larger characters. You can also decide the orientation of the words, the colors, and so forth. So here is a Wordle from me. So this is the summary of all my biographies, but the key words here are really what I am. I, am, I was in IBM for a long time. That's why it's very large. Hmm. I was in research, I'm still in research, also associated with university, which university, UC Berkeley, what is my area is multimedia, what did I do at Berkeley, my PhD is in engineering, etc. So graphical representation of long tests are something that we'll see more and more in the future. If you want to read the Healthcare Act that the Congress of the United States passed, it has 1,600 pages. Wouldn't you prefer to just see one image? And actually it transmits quite a bit. Here is a collection of all documents I could find on Citrus, where you are now, which is the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society. And if you look at Citrus and you start wondering what it is, one of the things you'll see is that Citrus is a four-campus institution. The campus are Berkeley, Merced, Santa Cruz, and Davis. If you want to know who are the main partners of Citrus, you'll find them here. It's the California Energy Commission and the California Telehealth Network et cetera, et cetera. So a representation, a graphical representation of a text are things that we're going to see more and more in the future. And again, if you decide on colors, on orientation of words and so forth, you can make a pretty good graphical image of a text. The title of this talk today is The Invasion of the Digital World. And I want to warn you right at the beginning that this talk is rated R. Uh, R, of course, is for research. Now, it's research that I have seen not only at IBM and here at Berkeley and Citrus, but research really that I see what I've been living most of my life, which is in Silicon Valley. This is a map of Silicon Valley for the very innovative companies that do research or have some research and development activities. It's amazing. It's the highest concentration of brain power, brain power in the world. Uh, Silicon Valley is also known for the average IQ of its people, which is very high. People are very intelligent in Silicon Valley. I cannot say otherwise because I lived there most of my life. But there is one thing that people are not in Silicon Valley is they are not very brave. They are really intelligent, but they are also very lazy. Look at this typical 24-hour fitness <laughs> club in Silicon Valley. People go up on an escalator. And to add insult to injury, they come down on an escalator. 
Now, I want to tell you, this is very near one of the major uh, electronic, digital electronic companies in the world. But I promised my friend from Google that I wouldn't say anything. So <laughs> they drive their cars here, 400 yards. And then they go to the fitness with an escalator. I really don't know what they do inside, but it must be very interesting. <laughs> the title of this talk is The Invasion of the Digital Worlds. And this talk really has two parts, which are like the yin and the yang. They complement each other. In the first part, I'm going to talk about small is the next big thing. I'm going to tell you how digital electronics is getting smaller, faster, cheaper, and so forth, things which you already know, and how that will impact all objects and things in the world that will be embedded with some intelligence, thanks to the fact that we can put a very inexpensive chip or digital electronics in it. So the second part of this uh, talk is on the smarter planet, how smarter things, smarter objects, smarter processes, and so forth are going to make our planet hopefully smarter. And the main point of this talk is, if, for those of you who read the abstract, is that we really live at the intersection of a planet of atoms and a planet of bits. And in that intersection, we don't know very, very well what are atoms and what are bits. So let me show you a very quick 20-second video to give you an illustration of the intersection of the planet of atoms and the planet of bits in which we live. Here is a 20-second video. Let's observe the effect of Evian on your body. Come on, sit down here. Now what you hear is not a test I'm popping to the beat And me to do And the first to try to move your feet See I Okay, that's enough So are these real babies? I don't think so I don't think this is a mini Cirque du Soleil these are just digitally produced babies. But when you live in that intersection of the world of atoms and the world of bits, you see certain things that are bits, but the things are real. And that's the world in which we are living and the world in which more and more we'll be living in the future. So let me start by the first part of this talk and talk about this small is the next big thing. I know that some of you play the lottery. And I know that not because you have a face which looks like professional gamblers, but uh, I'm very thankful that you actually play the lottery because thanks to the lottery, in fact, is that we have buildings like this one and institutions like the University of California because a part of the lottery that some of you are playing, and I encourage you to continue, goes to education. In fact, per year, an average of $14 billion goes to the education. So part of this building is thanks to your gambling addiction. Suppose that you are playing the, lot the lottery and there is a risk that you may make some money. So, for example, suppose you made $10,000 in one of your tickets. But now the lottery, instead of giving you the $10,000, offers you a, no a choice between $10,000 and 1 billion grains of rice. Which one would you take? And to make things a little more complicated, there will be a third option that they offer you, which will be 1 billion transistors. Now, because we value our cell phones and so forth, many of us would think transistors, right, if you had those three options. I will not tell you which option is the winner, but I'll tell you for sure that transistors are the worst possible option because transistors are dirt cheap. In fact, nowadays we produce many more transistors per year than grains of rice, and each transistor is much, much less expensive than one grain of rice. Transistors are becoming dirt cheap. Take, for example, uh, a chip that Intel announced in 2007, a very good processor chip, the Itanium. If you look at the specs of the Itanium, you'll find that it has 1.72 billion transistors, and depending on their density, how well they're packed and what they do, the chip will cost out of 20 models of uh, Itanium. The chip will cost between $530 and $4,227. So if you make the conversion, 1 billion transistors would cost about $300 to $2,500. That's certainly less than the $10,000 that we offered you to start with in cash. So transistors are cheap. They're more numerous than grains of rice and much cheaper. By the way, the 1 billion grains of rice would cost at Safeway price. It would cost about $30,000. So you should choose the 1 billion grains of rice if the lottery ever offers you that option. So with all those transistors, what can we do? Um, we can take a chip, which is one inch by one inch, 
And uh, by the way, that chip will have more processing power than the computers when I graduate from college. It's the most powerful computers that existed when I graduated from college. And also, chips are in cards like this. I have a card here, which I bought at CVS on Shattuck. Notice that this stock has some merchandising associated with it. I yet don't make any money out of it. But anyhow, you can also buy this card for 99 cents at the 99 cent store, also on Shattuck. And this card has one of these musical chips inside, but it has much more. It has loudspeakers, it has a battery, and I'm going to play this card for you. It's no trickery, it's really the card playing. And it's called the Chinkin Dance, which is very popular, I understand, in nudist camps. <laughs> Some of you got it, I'm glad. Okay, so this card has another feature than the chip which is inside it, and that's the novelty of this card, that's why I pay $4.99 at CBS, is that you can record on this chip a message. So this also has a recording mechanism. All set for $4.99. By the way, the chip which is inside here is costs about 30 to 60 cents, depending what it does. This is a very fancy one, probably 60 cents to $1 because it has a recording facility. So transistors are very inexpensive, very small, very fast, and become even more inexpensive, smaller and faster. So let's take one type of chip called an RFID. An RFID is a very small chip. That's RFID stands for radio frequency ID. It's a very small chip that doesn't have a battery, doesn't need a battery. It has some storage capability and so forth. And in fact, the chip is what is here at the end of this loop. This loop is really wires that serve as antenna. The chip has no battery. It is energized by radio frequency waves which are absorbed by the wires and transform those electromagnetic waves into electricity to charge condensers here that work like a battery. So it's a very small chip that doesn't have a battery and you can put anywhere. Today our FIDs are made for one or two cents each. And they are starting to change our world and by the way there are about 30 billion RFIDs in our world and what do they do? They eventually, once they become even cheaper than one cent, they will be in every object in the world, allow objects and things to talk to each other. So you can think that you put an RFID in your wallet and you go to a mall and in that RFID you're programmed that you need trousers, extra, extra, extra large, which is my size, and purple, which is not my color. <laughs> and you are walking in the mall with that. When you go by the window of a store, the window is emitting radio frequency, reading what people's RFIDs are telling them, and it will eventually communicate to you, say, listen, I happen to have, you are in luck. I happen to have an extra, extra, extra large trousers f in purple for so many dollars, which, by the way, is on sale this week. That on sale was just invented by the RFID. So this is allowing, RFIDs are going to allow objects and things to communicate among themselves. You could also locate a doctor in a hospital or whatever the doctor is. If a baby's in a hospital, you could make sure that a baby only leaves certain rooms in the company of people that are allowed to take the baby, et cetera, et cetera. So this communication is very important. And there are many other applications. Many of you saw in the windshield of cars here in Northern California, these fast track cars. The fast track card has an RFID inside. When you go by the toll booth and you don't have to stop, the toll booth emits radio frequencies that read the content of the card, which is really who you are and associates with that Sorry, this thing is falling. Associates uh, with that the time in which you went by the toll and then will charge you at the end of the month. Now, this toll booth system, this kind of RFID system, already existed for a long time. In fact, even McDonald's has considered putting a system like that in their drive through But what's new is that RFIDs are becoming so cheap and so popular that you can put them anywhere in a city. So you start now being able to, or in a road, and you start to be able to charge people for something called congestion pricing. Namely, you, people to enter a city or to go through a special lane of a road will have to pay a price which depends on how congested the traffic in that city or that road is. Congestion pricing started in Stockholm, where to enter Stockholm and now anywhere in the main part of the city, you have to pay. And depending on how many cars are inside, therefore, how difficult it will be to park, therefore, how much fuel you are going to spend, 
you're going to pay more to get into the city. It exists also in London, in downtown London. Those of you who have been there in the last four years have seen it. In Brisbane, now many other countries are adopting that. In fact, San Francisco is considering that. But because we know how many objects are inside a certain area or circulate in a certain area, we can do better. Uh, this week, California inaugurated, Northern California, in fact, the first uh, congestion pricing in one of its freeways, 680, about 14 miles. And when you go from Berkeley to San Jose, by the way, IBM Research is here, is where I also work once a week. When you go from one to the other, you go through these 14 miles, where you pay according to the congestion. If traffic is really st stopped everywhere and you cannot move, this will be a very high price. In fact, it will be $8 to go through those 14 miles. If traffic is very light, you can pay 50 cents and now they're consider, considering even less than 50 cents. So it depends on traffic and that's only possible because you can measure things. You can measure things because you have RFIDs. In Sweden, every Volvo that comes out of the uh, manufacturing line does have in this gas cap an RFID so that when you enter a gas station, a gas station knows who you are and in fact many uh, places in Sweden, many gas stations have robotic arms that will go and unscrew the cap of your gas tank and pump gas and he knows who you are and you just leave the gas station as soon as your tank is full. That's very useful in the winter because you don't have to get out of your car, etc. One of the things we are waiting for in the United States, and it depends on unions and other laws, is to have our FIDs in a shopping cart. Every object in a supermarket, instead of a barcode would have an RFID, which is a barcode on steroids because you can program it, you can change the price. The, <coughs> sorry, the object can tell the supermarket where it is, how many are left on the shelves, etc., because they're talking among themselves. But the main use, utilization of RFIDs will be that run today, when you go to a supermarket and you fuel your cart, as soon as you get to the cashier, the first thing you have to do is to take everything out and put on a conveyor belt that may or not work, or an aluminum surface where you have to push everything. And the cashier patiently tries to read the barcode in its machine and so forth, and at the end, <coughs> when everything is on the other side of the conveyor belt, what do you have to do? Put it back, everything in your cart. If you had RFIDs, all you'd have to do is to just walk out of the supermarket because the door would emit radio frequency would measure everything which is in your cart, would list it on the screen and give you a receipt, <coughs> and you're just going home without having to unload everything in the cart. So many years ago, in fact, IBM made a commercial because we thought that this would be possible to do in the United States. We forgot a number of local laws and unions and so forth. And here's a commercial of the shopping of the future. So the guard is there to say, you forgot your receipts, that's it. Even though this is still a dream here, and by the way, it doesn't exist in the United States, so don't go to Safeway, <laughs> fill your cart, you know, leave the door, and when you are arrested, you say, but the fat guy at Berkeley told me. No, it doesn't exist it's yet. But it exists in other countries. For example, in Germany, the supermarket chain Metro has tried in some stores, and it's already activated, <coughs> this kind of shopping with our FIDs in all objects. And in fact, you can subscribe to the system and you are billed every month for all your shopping. You're not even billed on the spot. So here is a commercial for Metro and this new system in the Metro supermarkets in Germany, in some Metro supermarkets. It's a cute one because it shows an old phone, which is what I owned when I started my professional life and so forth, and show the person who's my age.
Hello. Hi, Grandma. We're gonna come over for dinner right now. <laughs> is good for. So, <laughs> so continuous models is the next big thing. It's not only chips that you can make uh, with the traditional transistors, very small and very inexpensive. You can also photolithograph on the surface of the chip some things that is like a rectangle with some articulations and you can lift it up and make it into a little mirror that you can turn in any position you want. Very small mirrors. In fact, nowadays you can put about 200 of those mirrors across the diameter or the thickness of my hair. And this will make for a new type of projector. Suppose that I have a ship full of those mirrors. Each mirror is projecting on a screen a pixel, a little rectangular pixel that you can orient wherever you want. And the ship is going to project an image. This is a technology that has existed for a long time because we've been able to make these mirrors now for about 20 years at least. Quite small, but they're getting smaller and smaller. And you can all think of things like we did experimentally. By the way, for those who never knew, this is one of the first cell phones that could actually have an image. And this is an IBM cell phone. IBM made this about 10 years ago. And the projection of this uh, ship of mirrors was, would be on a screen, which happens to be a mirror also. And it could project whatever you wanted. We also imagine that. PDAs or telephones or whatever instrument you had could project on the wall images that otherwise would be very small to look at. And these chips can become very small. This is one of the smallest chips that existed about two years ago. It fitted inside this projector. This is actually a projector. It still needed electricity, but if you had a good source of electricity, it could project very strongly. And again, the dream was that instead of looking at a cell phone at a very small image, you could project and everybody or many people could share. You could also have very powerful small projectors, which already exist, by the way, provided that you can inject current, because the main problem here that the things consume lots of electricity, or that was the main problem. This is the smallest projector I could find to date. In fact, it is a projector, and it doesn't need electricity. It's a battery-activated projector, and it's being considered by many telephone companies to be able to project the image of your phone so that several people can share, and you can also see it much better. Ideally, you'd project it on an 8 by 11 white piece of paper. So these chips are really becoming very, very small, and with many, many mirrors. In fact, the world record of mirrors on a chip that serves as a projector is about 2 million mirrors, which would mean 2 million pixels. And uh, that's something that was attained some years ago, but it's still very expensive to put 2 million mirrors. But these chips are really becoming very, very, very small. Think of that, a chip that would go through the eye of a needle. This is fantastic, isn't it? It's a technological miracle to make needles this large. <laughs> because no way that a chip can go through the eye of a through the eye of a needle, but it will in the future. So, combine these chips that project with mirrors and image on the surface to create something called an intelligent mirror. Beyond that, we also have some very small cameras. You probably have small cameras. Oops. You probably have small cameras in your phone. Uh, but there are even smaller cameras. For example, Tessera in San Jose makes a camera which is maybe one millimeter in diameter. And it's actually a very good camera. If you put those things on a mirror, you put the cameras on the 
frame of the mirror and the ship behind the mirror projected an image on a mirrored one-way surface, you could have a mirror that would become intelligent. Not only it would show the face of a person, but it could respond to special things that a person does. For example, if the person is staring at a point in her face, because she has a pimple or a little mark, the cameras will know that because they will track the pupil of the person and would automatically magnify that area if you stare. <laughs> but it can do much better. You can put a chip that recognizes voice. And if you ask your mirror before you leave for the day, you could ask, mirror, mirror on the wall, will it rain at all? And the answer of the mirror would be to project a, a weather forecasting television station on your mirror. Even though this was a dream many years ago, we start to see the thing happening now as a possibility. The price is still very high, but here's the person in his bathroom, <coughs> and the mirror has a clock, has all kinds of activities for the day. In my case, it could have my presentation that I have to make at noon, so I could review it while I shave, which is not my case, as you can see, <laughs> etc. And by the way, this guy's also stepping on a scale. One of the tiles on the floor is a scale that gives his weight, and also all vital signs. <coughs> Sorry. The mirror could also project... Uh, a dress, and you could see yourself wearing the dress. And again, remember, even though these all look very realistic things, they're just research projects that may or not see the light of day. And, um, but this is a good utility. We have these uh, terminals, and you can buy one, computer terminals that have a little camera here. And the camera is tra tracking your pupil. Your pupil is this black disk. It's very easy to recognize because it's a perfect black circle, and you can track it. So the camera can now know what you're looking at. So suppose that these terminals were here outside the lobby, and people would come day in and day out and look at this schedule of seminars. But the camera would be tracking them. So usually you stay longer in a seminar that is of special interest to you. So the camera would know how many people are looking at this and could make an estimate, by the way, for the food of how many people come to each seminar. This is not a good uh, application of these cameras, but a good application is in search. You do a search today on anything you want, and it gives you 22, Google says, 22 million results. Would you like to see the 10 first ones? Of 22 million, what does that mean? You don't know if you're going to hit anything in the 10 first ones. But if you look at the 10 first hits and you focus on one hit that has the key words or the words that you are interested in or the subject you're interested in, now the computer will know what is the reference you're interested in, will extract the key words of that reference and filter the other 21,990,999 so that the next 10 ones that are shown on the screen will be matching those key words that you showed interest by staring at them. It would be very nice if not only would you be able to know what people are looking at, for example, in a store, shelves with these little cameras, what are people looking at the shelves, where are they staring, what's of interest, but also are they looking because they like it or because they are surprised. So it would be very nice to have cameras that could identify, <coughs> could identify what a person uh, is, how a person is reacting. Now, it's possible to draw isometric lines on the face of a person, and if the person exaggerates his or her expressions, we can distinguish between, let's say, six or seven different expressions. But a person really has to exaggerate. We cannot still do, if a person recognizes the reactions of a person with very small changes in the facial expression. Not this way. We could examine a person's reaction if we would instrument that person. And um, we've done that with graduate students, by the way. This is a graduate student, and of those six images, one never applied to him. He never smiled. Now, if you had those things stuck to your face day and night, because we're asking him to carry this, then, by the way, it's not me. It's a, he's a student at Carnegie Mellon, or was a student. Now I think he's a taxi driver or something like that. So, <laughs> it's, I hope he's not seeing this on the web. <laughs> I do need taxes, by the way. So, anyhow, you could instrument a person to examine the reaction. But cameras have other utilities. You could think of cameras, and there are many companies doing cameras to kind of uh, improve the vision of persons who are vision disabled, either by putting cameras in the glasses or making artificial eyes that have little cameras. And in fact, the cameras can be embedded in a chip that does all the processing of the image and transmit electrical signals to the optical nerve or to the cortex of the brain, which is where you recognize images. 
So these kind of sensors and cameras are also sensors. They are sensing images and so forth. We're considered by computer world and still considered by many of us and many magazines as the top game-changing technology. This is going to change the world if we start populating the world with sensors. In fact, these sensors are so numerous, I said we have already 30 billion. We might go to two or 300 billion in a few years. The sensors are so prevalent that we can think that the world is being covered with a skin, but with our skin is a sensor. It senses heat, it senses shock, and so forth. And the world, the physical world, the world of astronauts, is being covered by this web of sensors, by this skin that will fill the rest of the world. So once the world is covered by this skin, and once the world has all these sensors, and all these cameras, and so forth, you can see that every object can have one of these intelligent chips in it. <clears throat> and in fact, objects now will be able to identify where they are, they'll be able to interconnect with other objects, and they'll be able to be intelligent also. So the second part of this talk has to do with the use of all this technology and the skins that the world is being dressed with, which is a digital skin to form a smarter planet. Now in this smarter planet, like I told you, we live at the intersection of the world of atoms and the world of bits. In this smarter planet, you look at things and you don't know if they are real or if they are digital. And you don't care because they do the things you want. So let's start with some of the applications of this digital world. One of them is not only you are at the intersection, but let's think that you are talking about arts and entertainment. <coughs> How did arts and entertainment change? And I'm going to cover only a couple of aspects of arts and entertainment with this advent or this invasion of this digital world of uh, bits and bytes. Let's start with the babies. You saw the babies dancing. How do we make those babies digitally? It's very simple. And in fact, any object can become animated. You cover a person, a real person, with markers, like little ping pong balls. And as this person dances or walks or does anything, <coughs> I'm very sorry, but I'm starting with a better cold. So. As a person does anything, these markers will move accordingly, and now you create a wireframe on a computer in which the nodes of this wireframe move as the markers move. So as the person leans forward, the wireframe leans forward. So really everything starts with a wireframe whose nodes move like the markers on the real person. And you can now do things that in the past we never dreamt. This is a digital actress. In fact, it's a wireframe covered with a skin. And the skin of that person makes, it, makes her look real. You can buy her. You can buy a digital actress. Indiana Jones, who was the actor Harrison Ford, was also digitized and made into a wireframe. In fact, when you see a movie by Indiana Jones, and Indiana Jones is among serpents and snakes and so forth, that is, don't worry. There is no risk to Indiana Jones. The only risk is a computer crash. And you see, any movie you see in which there is a scene of danger, we don't have any more doubles. We have computer simulations of the actors that will move like a wireframe. So let's, let me show you one of the first such wireframes that moves like people, which is a story of a father and a son or mother and daughter or mother and son lamps. It's called Luxor. And it's a sort of Luxor unit, the small lamp that's playing with a ball. Now, this started with two people doing that with markers, and now this was transmitted by Pixar, which is in Emeryville. I hope I'm pointing in the, wrong in the right direction. Pixar in Emeryville are neighbors. They did that, and that was the first Oscar for an animated cartoon. So here it is. First, you're going to see the wireframe. Then we're going to dress up these wireframes with real skin.
It's strange that one feels emotions, even though the, we know there are objects and this is computer drawn and so forth. In fact, there is right now on the web a video of a robot who's dancing Swan Lake. I don't know how many of you saw. It's a very ugly robot. Only the upper part does. But you feel the emotion because it does all the movements of a swan who's dying and so forth. So it's very interesting. Here is the baby, the first dancing baby ever. It's actually, he was created about the same time as Luxor Jr. 10 years ago. And for those of you who are closer to the screen, you can see the pixelization. This is a baby with very few pixels. <coughs> and you can see the straight lines of the pixels on his head. But even then, just by making this wireframe dance covered with the skin of a baby, it gives you a very nice sensation. And most of you have seen this video, so let's go quickly through it. Okay. This was very primitive compared to having many babies roller skating. So the question is to you, can babies roller skate? The answer is probably not. I never saw babies roller skating, not that well, by the way. And they all roller skate together, so <coughs> it has to be digital, right? And it is digital. So here is the latest word on roller skating babies. Let's observe the effect of Evian on your body. Come on, sit down here. Hop, the hip, the hip to the hip, hip, hop, and you don't stop. The rocket to the bang, bang, boogie, set up, jump, the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie to be. Now, what you hear is not a test. I'm rocking to the beat. And me, the groove, and the friends are going to try to move your feet. So this video is sponsored by Evian. I have no idea whether they're sponsoring this. Maybe they want pregnant mothers to start drinking Evian in the hope that their babies will come out that well. But <laughs> the other objects that are going to change very much, but you don't know how, and you'll be part of those who decide, are the books. How will the book be in a world where there are more than atoms, there are also bits, to be part of the book. Will the book be all in bits? Will it be all in the real world, which is paper? The answer is probably not in the real world because a book is nothing more than non-biodegradable ink on a dead tree. Paper is just a dead tree. So forget books. They're not going to last for too long. But the question is, will that format continue? So let's see what the drawbacks of books are. One of the main drawbacks is that books come in the preset fonts and they don't adapt to a reader's eyesight. My eyesight is very bad. <coughs> I cannot read the book which is there to the lower right. And in fact, uh, if I ask the book, book, oh book, please increase your font size, the book would do nothing for me. <laughs> so they are not very responsive. They're not user-oriented or user-adaptable. So they're not usable. Not for me, maybe not for you either. Mainly books like this with very small fonts, they were built with very small fonts, they were composed with very small fonts, so that less paper would be used and they would be cheaper. But nobody can read, read them. And people react very angrily for objects which are not very usable. <laughs> they don't like that. In fact, can you imagine a world in which things were designed not having usability in mind? Look at the sacrifices that we would have to make. Things do not be very easy for us. And this is how we would have to read books. In fact, I have one of these because I use this. What is my, my magnifying glass? I don't know. I have my magnifying glass. So, are we going to change books by e-readers because e-readers allows us to put the character or the font, the size we want, and so forth? Or are we going to continue to love books and try to do something else? For example, compensate for the deficiencies that I just mentioned by having something called flexible 
paper or e-paper, in fact, e-ink. In fact, I have here a display, a flexible display, which has e-ink, it's a simulation, and I have my presentation here. So I can just use my presentation on a flexible display. Now, the way this flexible display and this e-ink works is that there are two plastic sheets, like this one, and between them is a liquid, and in suspension in the liquid are small spheres, half of which is black, half of which is white, and by applying magnetic currents on small wires on top, magnetic fields will turn these spheres upside down or leave them as they are, so you'll see black and white dots which will make it, uh, which will make the image. And now we can also do that in color. So it's possible, possibly to make a book in which the pages would be all flexible displays. Is that what we want as opposed to an e-reader or to one page only? We really don't know. But in a, as an experiment, uh, IBM made a one-page newspaper about seven years ago and tried to see how people adapted to the idea of buying one newspaper for the rest of your life and changing the contents every day or every hour. Because that's the other problem with newspapers. They don't change their contents during, contents during the day. How about if you had an electronic one simulated? Because if we are in love with the format of a newspaper, a book, or a magazine, maybe we want to compensate for those deficiencies keeping the format together. Newspapers are disappearing for a number of reasons. One of them is that they don't update themselves during the day. In fact, this is a map that the New York Times published of the United States showing that of 3,000 papers in the United States, only three of them had their circulation increased from one year to the next. So most newspapers were going down. In fact, the uh, inserts here of newspapers that disappeared, including the San Francisco Chronicle, which disappeared, I guess, last year, and now we only have the San Francisco Examiner. So it is predicted that in five years from now, approximately 2016, practically nobody will read newspapers. Now, I want to tell you that this is one of my slides that makes me the most proud. It's a slide of the future. I managed to travel to the future and took a picture unique of nobody reading the newspaper. <laughs> this is a picture of nobody reading the newspaper. At least not this format of newspaper. People like instant news, they like the Twitters, they like the uh, instant news. However, the format of newspaper still has an attractive, at least for people like us. The younger people don't read newspaper. Less than 1% of people 17 or younger ever read a newspaper even. They may look at it, but they don't read newspaper. But do we still want to go a few years simulating a newspaper like in an electronic tablets? Uh, it's a very hard question to answer because we know that people are attracted to the printed text. Now, is that printed is electronic or not? We are still attracted to it. It's probably the format which we got used to of a book, newspaper, or magazine that attract us. But there is another problem. You don't want to carry only one book with you. In this world changes that fast, or even at the university, you want to carry 20, 30, 40, and they're very heavy. So about instead of carrying one book, you'll carry a thousand book or 1,500 books. That's why these electronic readers like the Kindle, and by the way, 20 of them have been announced in the last 12 months. The last one was on Monday of this week, the day before yesterday, Research in Motion that makes the Blackberries announced a new electronic reader, which is between an electronic reader and an iPad. The other problem with books is that there are no animations. There are no videos, no audio. We don't know if we want that or not. So we're still experimenting. Do we want a book that has animation, videos, or audio? Yes, if it's a medical book, you would like to see a procedure, you would like to see a video of the procedure. But how about regular animations and videos? Is it possible? Yes, it is. September 9th of last year, the magazine Entertainment Weekly published an issue in which there was a chip inside a page that produced a video on a small screen, yes, but 40 minutes of video in a chip. It had a battery and it produced 40 minutes of video and you could play it for about 40 days or something like that. It was amazing the quality and the quantity of videos that you could put in a chip. And this issue immediately expired as soon as it was sold and uh, there were no more issues available and in fact, if you want to buy one on eBay, it sold for $600 to $1,000 at that time. I don't know today how much it sells. So unique it was, and so much was the demand to see a magazine with video. Was this because it was a novelty, or people really want to see videos? The company that makes these ships is now still making them and have sold to other magazines, and we are starting to see magazines that have videos in print. Now, how about books? 
would you like to see a video of a book? And that's a very good question. We don't know the answer. Namely, most authors describe, like this author here, who writes Jeff Carson, whose all books have the word plague, he describes scenes like mountains covered with snow or forests and so forth. And every time he's describing in one of his books a scene or a person, he films, he takes a video, and you can find it on the web. So you can see how for a certain scenery, how this author described, which words were used to describe that scenery. Is that something that we are interested in or not? I mean, if you put video, now you can put the video on the cover of the book. In fact, some books are coming out with videos. Are you interested in seeing what the author saw and understanding better the words of the author? We don't know yet the answer, but there is something very interesting. Uh, books are losing popularity like newspaper. In fact, Amazon.com announced about a month and a half ago that its sale of electronic books, the contents of a book to a reader, surpassed the sale of hardcover books. So now it's official. E-books sell more than hardcover books. So, but what happens to e-books? The author that has the most e-books sold is Stieg Larsson. In fact, Amazon.com has sold one million of his e-books. This is the third book in a trilogy called the Millennium Trilogy. And this book completed the one million e-books sold just to the Kindle much more than any hard copy books that Amazon has ever sold. Evidently, one million is lost. Now, what happened to this book? Stieg Larsson, how many of you have read this book, by the way, or any book by Stieg Larsson? Well, lots of you, eight, nine, <laughs> eight point three, because the guy <laughs> took his hand down very quick. Eight point three of you read. So he describes the wonderful scenes of Stockholm. So what happened is that during the summer that just ended, even though the weather doesn't tell us so, during the summer that just ended, lots of people signed up for tours, which are literary tours, to go to Stockholm and see the places that Stieg Larsson had described in his trilogy. So people go and all they do in Stockholm for one week is visit the places that he described and then they can read the book again and see if their description of that place will be uh, the same as Stieg Larsson. So there is a market for people who want to see what the person is describing in words. How much of that market, I don't know. Am I, uh, am, am I done? <laughs> Boy, I'm treat no, a question, no, he treats me like a steak, you know, I said you are done. So, <laughs> I only have two more. I know that you have classes, so let me go very quickly. Medicine and health, again, you live in a digital world as well as a physical world, atoms and beats. But so does your doctor. Because more and more you're going to see in hospitals, and there are some in the Bay Area, sorry, in which doctors come and visit you through a robot. And there are many of these robots, Kaiser is starting some experiments, in which the doctor at home can visit many patients <coughs> without having to displace him or herself from a hospital to another. Medicines. Medicines are also part of this new digital world. It used to be, and it's still for most of you and for me today, that medicines were done to cure a disease. So medicine compensated for a disease. That's not very good because each person has different allergies and so forth. Many people are allergic to some medicine. Each person takes different collections of medicines and they interfere with each other. So medicines are no longer being prepared, and each time less will be prepared for disease, but medicines will be prepared to cure a patient that has a disease. Take into consideration the DNA of the patient and the genetic consistency of the patient. There is a medicine that cures cancer called tamoxifen. It only is effective in 6% of the cancer cases, but as it happens, it was discovered that the 6%, most of them had this gene here, CYP2D6. So if you knew the genetic structure of a person, the person has their gene, probably tamoxifen will be efficient. So I will do, I'll do one more thing here very quickly, okay? Two more minutes. I always say that. Here is a digital object that looks like a real one. It's a magnifying lens, and I had one here. It's a magnifying lens, only that it's electronic. It looks like this, only that it has cameras on the frame. The cameras are picking up the text and displaying on the screen what is picking up, but it looks like a magnifying lens. Obviously, it's a variable magnification. You can make the characters the size you want because it's all digital, but it does much more. As you look at a newspaper, it can translate 
to a different language. You can look at the Swedish newspaper with this magnifying lens and read. It has a, also a little blue button in the middle to the right-hand side that you press if you're diabetic. I am diabetic. And why do you press if you're diabetic? Because it's considered and known that people with visual challenges, you can read it. So why, and newspapers are black ink on white paper. Diabetic people, myself, have some problem reading newspaper. How about if we inverted the colors? Let the magnifying lens invert the color. Okay, computerized tomography. Machines will take slices of your body and tell your doctor what those slices are. Your doctor can analyze you. If you don't know what machine it is, you go to another digital world, which is 3D virtual world called Second Life, where you can visit all the instruments that you're going to be submitted to, so you lose the fear of the unknown. Collaboration started with this explosion, which I call the Big Bang, the explosion of collaborative networks. Wikipedia is the effect of a collaboration. Horizon Report is an educational report written in collaboration by anyone who wants to go to the web. 300 professors have produced this report on technologies that will be used in education. I'm running out of fuel, so are you. Summary. The digital world in which we live, as well as the physical world, would allow us to produce objects and things that look like the real world, to have hybrid doctors or hybrid professionals, and finally to allow us collaboration. Ah, one last thought, something I have to remember to tell you. There is an old Chinese proverb, an old Chinese proverb which I invented six months ago. <laughs> And the Chinese proverb says the following. The mind can only absorb what your rear end can endure. So your rear end is probably telling you it's time to finish, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. Thank you very much. Hi, Professor. Uh, 20 years ago, I got the complete works of William Shakespeare on uh, about a dozen double-density uh, floppy disks, uh, which read in Word, Microsoft Word version 4.0 for the Mac, System 6. Uh, it was amazing to have the entire works of Shakespeare in something that could fit in a nice big handful of me. I'm over here. Uh, today, of course, they're useless. Of the 30, because there are no floppy drives, there's no System 6, etc. Uh, five years from now, how many of the 30 ebook readers that you mentioned have come out right now do you think will be useful? Yeah. People are also obsolete. People die also, so and they disappear. So technologies disappear. The question is, how do we preserve memories that were important? like literary works and so forth. Doug, pardon? Like, I can read a complete work of Shakespeare published 200 years ago. Yes. In fine condition right now, as long as I use a magnifying glass. You can, but the question, you can. And other people may want so. But uh, each time less, the memories that people have of Shakespeare 200 years ago are going to disappear. The young people may not even know who Shakespeare is. And uh, you say, oh, what a pity. <laughs> you can preserve those memories electronically. There are technologies to do that. It's a very high cost. The question is, do we want? But you are right. You can read Shakespeare in the original paper 400 years ago. It has its own smell, sorry for the expression. It has its own smell, texture, and so forth, and you recognize that book in your bookshelf. That's Shakespeare. But I think that the new generations are giving less and less value to those things. Culture is changing to them, for them. And um, so I'm not saying it's not possible. I think it's possible, it's expensive. Who's going to want to do it? I don't know. The young people, people who are under 15 today, growing up, I don't know what they are going to want in the future, but I don't, probably Shakespeare will not be in very high demand. 
Like opera, you know, opera is wonderful. There are some operas that cost a fortune to put on. How many young people have seen an opera performance at the San Francisco Opera who are not there forced by their parents? <laughs> or even maybe with uh, <laughs> chains. Um, so I, I feel this is actually really important to something that I didn't feel like you mentioned on this talk, is, is that, yeah, I'm standing back here, so I'm manning the compost. Oh, band. you're standing back. Thank All you. right, yeah. Uh, I, I feel that um, a lot of things you pointed out have a certain impetus of responsibility and ethics associated with them. And so, for instance, the RFID tags, you said you'd be able to tell if a child was taken out of the ER. Are you implanting a chip in the child? And, I mean, you're showing this, these commercials with the water bottles. Like, uh, I have a personal thing against water bottles. But uh, evoking emotion in a way that actually degrades the sustainable environment. And how can we balance control of resources with human freedom and in the new digital world? That's a very good question. Privacy and sustainability. Those are the two parts of your question. Privacy is easier because uh, children are identified by bracelets. In a hospital, you can just take the bracelet out. And now every object you buy in a store that has an RFID, it has a, a, a way of clipping by hand, clipping the tag so that the antenna is cut and the RFID is inactive. <coughs> the sustainability, namely, I advertise bottled water, which cannot be really going on because these plastics are ways of making plastics are not biodegradable and we are going to saturate the world. So sustainability is a the problem, privacy is a problem, so I didn't cover many of those things in my talk, but yes, there are problems, we have to face them, we should be aware, I'm glad you brought it up, because when we choose which technology we want, we should also choose which way we're going to preserve privacy and the sustainability of the universe. Thank you.